may even have some topology. Uh, in fact, when I met George for the first time, not two years ago, he gave me a book of his called Poincaré's Prize, which has a zebra. Poincaré. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, George spans all kinds of things. First, the continents. He was born in Europe, his work in Israel, and now in the United States. He studied in Zurich and in Stanford. I believe also in Columbia. No, no. Uh, Hebrew, University. Hebrew University. I'm sorry. That also, and then also the subjects: mathematics, physics, business, financial mathematics. And he's written not only studied these, he's written papers in these subjects, and also written books about them. And books, the papers were for the specialists, and books were for the non-specialists. So it's an enormous span. I first came across his name when I was visiting Zurich 15 years ago. There was an article about the Forschungsinstitut für Mathematik at the ETH. And it was very nice. I think they had some 50th anniversary. And you I think you interviewed Ekman. It was a very, I was surprised at how intelligent the article was about mathematics. <laughs> I, I didn't know George then, and I'm not surprised now, but at the time it was a shock to see that mathematics was written about very sensibly and very intelligently. And since then I've read other things of his. Um, and in particular, last. Uh, September, he interviewed Mike Latia in Heidelberg, and that's very interesting. I, I, I actually read it out quite carefully because I had to translate it from, my, from German <laughs> into English. <laughs> All right, so today he will talk to us about the truth, the, not, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, as entertaining as <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and thanks for coming. I understand you're preparing your exams right now, so I don't know if you're taking time off from studying, but thanks for coming. Um, so I studied mathematics originally and then I got into journalism and uh, regular journalism, uh, reporting on politics and uh, Middle East conflict, and uh, one day I suggested to my editors in Zurich that maybe we should do something about math. Um, they uh, agreed to that and for seven years I had a monthly column on mathematics. Um, after seven years it ended because uh, columns sometimes end, they want to change things. Um, but uh, anyway, I also write whenever there's something news like uh, the Abel Prize, uh, recently uh, uh, Nash and Nirenberg, and uh, whenever there's something interesting about mathematics, I write about it, and there are certain challenges. I understand that in the uh, course on differential equations, you have skills, which is how to write a mathematical paper. So you see here, it's different to write for mathematicians than for the general reader. The newspaper that I write for is a daily newspaper, so it's general readers, uh, lawyers, uh, business people, scientists also, but not necessarily mathematicians. So I'll talk a bit about how, how a journalist can write for the general public about mathematics. Mathematics is a very technical subject. It's even writing about science when you write about physics or biology or medicine, it's fairly simple. I mean, uh, you can explain the problem, people are aware of what you're talking about. In mathematics, it's so technical that it has separate uh, challenges. So let me start. Uh, First of all, academics and journalists have different aims. So what you learn in the skills part of the differential equations uh, course would be for academics. I write for the general public. So let's see. For instance, uh, academics, uh, not everybody is obliged to read what, what you write. Only the people in your subject. Sometimes there's just a dozen people all over the world who really understand what you're writing about. In journalism, of course, you try to write for thousands of people, not just for people who know what you're talking about. People who have no idea when they start reading the article. So it's a different audience. Then uh, academics must, those who are in your subject, they're obliged to read your articles. In journalism, 
they only read what they want. So also you have to sort of market your article, uh, try to make, get people to read it. Nobody's obliged to read your article. Um, then academics are expected to spend time on the article. They can spend weeks on, on the article, let's say, just because uh, Andrew mentioned Poincaré's proof, uh, people work for two years trying to understand Perlman's proof. More like 12 by now. Pardon? More like 12, 12 by now. Yes, yes. And by the way, the zebra on the book cover has nothing to do with the book. Uh, it was some graphic designer who thought it fits nicely. <laughs> so I don't know how it got there. <laughs> uh, anyway, if in journalism, you really have to serve your subject on a silver platter. You have to be aware of what the problems are for a general reader and really spoon feed them. Whereas an academic is uh, expected to really work through the article. You can't expect that from a general reader. He or she will just continue to the next article. Um, uh, academics need to be informed in a very rigorous fashion. The proofs have to be rigorous and watertight. Um, journalism, you have to inform, but also to entertain. It goes that they only read what they want. So if you're writing, even if everything is very important and very correct, but it's not interesting, people won't read it. So you have to also entertain, in a way. Um, it, an academic article is read after years and years, it stays the classics, you, you still study them, whereas in journalism they're forgotten the next day, so I'm... Uh, <laughs> fish and chips. <laughs> Pardon? Used for fish and chips. Yeah. <laughs> ah. <laughs> um, okay, so ah, also uh, academics, you have a, enough as much space as you need to explain your article within the limits of the of the uh, journal, but you get uh, whatever three pages, thirty pages, whatever is needed. In a newspaper article, you have between three hundred and thousand words. It's it's not much. Uh, in magazines, if you write a magazine article, you have more space. But usually, in my in a daily paper, you have maybe one column. Uh, if you're lucky, usually half a column to explain. So I'll tell you uh, what are the things you want to do in these 300 to 1,000 words. Um, so you need a good title, okay, that gets the person to re uh, to to uh, it should jump out uh, and say something to you that will make you read on. Uh, then, in the article, you need an explanation of the problem, you need the history and background of the problem, unsuccessful attempts at the proof, uh, personality of the mathematician who found the proof. That's for academics, it's uninteresting. Who cares who the author is or what he or she did? But in an article, you want to be a bit more uh, informative, so the, people, the readers would like to know who is the person who, who found this fantastic proof? What's he like? What's she? Uh, what are her hobbies or whatever? So also the personality. Uh, then now comes the really nitty gritty: the procedure of the proof, or at least an idea of the proof. And here, that that's a real challenge and very often a problem. And many uh, journalists who write about mathematics occasionally, but are not trained as mathematicians they will really foul up here. They'll uh, either just not talk about it at all, or they get the things wrong or whatever, they can make mistakes. So this is really the most, most difficult part of writing an article about mathematics. And then you want uh, implications, what does the theory uh, tell you, what, uh, what's it good for? And there also there's a problem. Sometimes mathematical theorem is good for nothing right now. I mean, it's just interesting. It's, uh, it furthers human knowledge, but there's no application. General readers sometimes go, well, what's it good for? And so, uh, like Hardy said, number theory is good for nothing. It just turns out lately that it's very, very important. But uh, 
uh, uh, it has very important applications. So here you sh one should try to explain what the theorem or the theory uh, really is good for. Why is it interesting? Um, so uh, the first thing was you, you need a good title because that's what that's written in boldface, in larger font. That's what the when person leaves through the newspaper. That's what they see first. So you need something that's interesting. Like uh, I quote <laughs> myself here, my my, which I thought were good titles. But anyway, the Catalanian rabbi's problem sounds interesting. People <laughs> would uh, continue reading. Uh, twins, cousins, and sexy primes. Uh, you know, twin, uh, twin prime problem and so on. So that, ah, you see sexy primes. I mean, what I mean is primes that are uh, uh, removed six numbers from each other. Uh, like twin prime problems. So there are four uh, primes that are uh, removed four uh, numbers and those that are removed six from each other. So they're called sexy primes. Looks like a nice title. Uh, general reader may be induced to read the, the article. Uh, nets and knots sounds nice. Also catchy title. Knots and unknots. Group, monster groups and baby monsters. That's actually, these are terms in, in group theory. So that's good for uh, th that's good for a title. It, it entices the general reader to maybe not leaf over, but actually read the article. Then you try to explain the problem. And now here, here start my problem. So <laughs> let's say Kepler's conjecture, that's the densest packing problem, how to uh, pack spheres in the densest manner. That's quite easy, it's geometry. You can explain that's how the vegetable uh, on the veg uh, fruit market, they stack oranges or tomatoes. So that's very, um, how do you say, uh, people can understand. You, you, can, you can explain that problem fairly easy. It's, geometry is usually fairly easy. Uh, number theory, Fermat's theorem, is relatively easy also. That, uh, uh, you can explain it in two sentences and the general reader will, will understand it. Poincaré's is con a conjecture is difficult. Topology, as you may know, when you took Andrew's course, is not quite as easy. <laughs> so, and uh, Poincaré's uh, conjecture is quite difficult to explain to a general reader. And then Hodge's conjecture or things like that there you raise your arms. I mean, you can <laughs> simply not explain it to, in, in a newspaper article. Now, the next thing is, let's say, history and background of the problem. You want to, that's also in an academic article. You would also start in the beginning with the history and the uh, background, but in a newspaper article, you, you want to make it interesting. So, for instance, uh, Ramanujan tells uh, Hardy about taxicab numbers. He was in hospital, he was dying, and Hardy came in and said, he, uh, maybe you know the story, he just took a taxi with a number, whatever, 7154. He's never seen such a boring one number. Seven, two, what was it? 1729. Seven, 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 okay, I don't have a job. Oh, 1729. <laughs> never seen such a boring number. <laughs> so many. Ramani, uh, Ramanujan immediately goes into a uh, uh, lecture on why this number is very special. So anyway, so that's an interesting story for the general reader. That's, uh, they can follow it, you can explain it, and it's very interesting. Or uh, Ramanujan writes to Hardy from his deathbed about mock theta functions. Uh, that's also, I mean, the whole story of the picture, uh, Ramanujan, the young man from India who came, who didn't, uh, couldn't suffer the uh, climate in, in Cambridge, who didn't eat the food uh, because he was ve uh, not uh, vegan or vegetarian. And, uh, so he, he eventually succumbed to all these miseries, but from his deathbed, he still wrote a letter that only recently uh, people understand uh, more about these theta functions. So that's also a very interesting background story 
uh, uh, that you can tell the general newspaper reader. Um, okay, game theory, there's a notion in game theory called the nucleolus, and actually um, in, in the Jewish Talmud, uh, when was the Talmud written? Maybe my daughter knows, no. <laughs> anyway, uh, long time ago, long time ago, before game theory was ever uh, a subject, there was something that actually uh, describes the nucleolus. The nucleolus is something in game theory where you have to divide something among several people. Anyway, uh, Robert Aumann, who was a mathematician at the Hebrew University, uh, Nobel Prize in, game, in uh, economics um, and ga uh, in game theory. So he, he's an Orthodox Jew and he knows the Talmud. And he found that in the Talmud already, this notion of the nucleolus was actually described. So that's an interesting story for general readers. Not, not for academics as necessarily, but in a newspaper that's quite interesting. Um, or the roots of Sudoku in the works of Albrecht Dürer and Leonhard Euler. So you can explain Sudoku was a big craze. I think it's less now, but it used to be. And then to t tell the readers that actually it's not just like crossword puzzles a game, but there's some serious math and Dürer and Euler, for example, already dealt with it. <clears throat> the next thing in an article would be unsuccessful attempts at a proof. So, uh, for instance, Alfred Kempe's faulty proof of the four-color problem in 1879. It's an interesting story that he thought he had proved it, and it turned out not, and the four-color theory then stayed until 19, I can't remember, 70 or 80. It wasn't proved. So, um, that you can put in, into a newspaper article, uh, Penny Smith's faulty proof of the, of the Navier-Stokes problem. Also, a woman mathematician who was very happy all over the internet at the time. Oh, was it? I can't remember which year, but it, it was already, the internet was already there. And then, of course, somebody very, quick, not of course, but unfortunately, very quickly found a fault. And it was uh, uh, a major story among mathematicians how this didn't work out. Uh, Andrew Wiles' first incomplete attempt to prove Fermat's problem and how he had thought and there was uh, people applauded uh, in Cambridge when he did his proof and then a few weeks later the, a hole was found. So that's also something you tell, why, why, why do you tell this to the general readers? Because that's how mathematics works and you don't just tell the success stories, but you tell also the labor that went into uh, developing a theory or a theorem. The, uh, a lawyer or an accountant should understand how mathematicians work. So these are all examples that bring math closer to the general reader. Um, or Ildirim and Goldstone's faulty advance towards the twin prime conjecture, and then a few months later, the correction of that, that's a really very exciting story, how it worked. They thought they had uh, Goldstone, they were too unknown, they are, sorry, they are too, no, they were unknown, they still are mathematicians, but they were unknown at the time, all of a sudden, a proof. Recently there was something similar with uh, somebody from China who in America taught at a very, uh, some unknown college and found a proof, I can't remember now, what Chang. it is. Chang. Uh, and what was it about? That uh, is, oh, well, he, that uh, bonded uh, differences ah, he bounded in, in, infinitely many times between the primes. So ah, uh, uh, okay. So, so these are interesting stories that you can tell the general reader about to make them understand what, what mathematicians do, what, ma what mathematics is about. Then you want also the personality of the of the people behind the proof. And that's where, um, in an academic paper, you would never waste any time on who's the person. Okay, you just give the affiliation, which university or whatever, but 
there are many interesting things. That's one of the interesting things I found when writing. The more you look, the more you find about people, really interesting characters. So Stephen Snail was a Vietnam War protester, really hippie movement, uh, uh, somewhere in South America on the beach. He did his math and he was kicked out or whatever, the National Science Foundation stopped his grants because he's just sitting on the beach and he said a mathematician can do math wherever you sit, so why not on the beach? Uh, anyway, so very interesting person, very interesting personality. Uh, Terry, uh, Terry Tao, who at age 12 won gold medals in, in the Mathematical Olympiad, uh, got the highest scores ever anywhere. He's a Fields medalist. He's now at UCLA. You may be familiar with him. But anyway, a wonder child, if there ever was one. Uh, and uh, very interesting person, very unassuming. He knows full well how good he is, but he's not uh, a show-off or anything. So he, he's, as a personality, he's very interesting. <coughs> Grigory Perlman. Totally nobody knows where he is, nobody knows what he does, he disappeared. He's the person who proved the Poincaré conjecture. You may have heard that was 2003, so it's 12 years ago. All of a sudden, on the internet, four papers which proved the uh, Poincaré conjecture. Nobody believed it. Uh, who, who's Perelman? Uh, he, was, he was well known already, but nobody knew he was even working on the, on the, uh, on the Poincaré conjecture. And, he had gone off, he, he got into an argument with his, uh, at the Steklov Institute, uh, in, uh, so he just resigned, went off, lived in uh, St. Petersburg in his mother's apartment. Nobody knew what he was doing. All of a sudden, four papers appear on the internet, and the years after that, people started checking his papers, and then he disappeared. So he was awarded the Fields Medal in 2006. Yes, 2006. He just didn't show up. The, it was in Madrid, the Fields ceremony, and King Juan Carlos was there with a the medal, and Grigory Perlman didn't show up. There were, four, there were four medals awarded, so three people showed up, but Perlman didn't show up. He didn't want to have anything to do with that. It's a rat race and so on. So he disappeared. Uh, three or four years later, he was awarded a million dollar prize from the Clay Foundation for this achievement, the Poincaré conjecture. Again, didn't show up, didn't want the money. Uh, the money went back to the foundation, a million dollars. Nobody knows what he does now. Nobody knows. When I wrote the book, I tried uh, to get in touch with him. and. Uh, I'm not with him directly, of course, he doesn't answer any emails, but every people who knew him wouldn't tell, uh, people who told me how to get in touch with him, they just didn't know what they were talking about. Impossible, impossible to meet him. Uh, there was one person who did meet him, um, that's Sylvia Nassar, who wrote A Beautiful Mind, if you know the book about John Nash. She traveled to uh, Leningrad, uh, St. Petersburg, and she did manage to see him. And there's a long, long article uh, that she wrote in the New Yorker. Yes? You have and also question? John Ball was able to manage to see him right before the ICM. Th that's right. And he tried, that, that's the president of the ICM who wanted him IMU. very much, uh, IMU, sorry, the IMU, who very much wanted him to come. Uh, to, to Madrid to accept uh, the award, and he didn't have any success, but he did see it. Yes? Yeah, interestingly, Terry Tao was, uh, was awarded the Fields Medal at that Madrid uh, 2006, conference. yes. And it was during that conference that, in fact, he decided to learn the proof of the Prancre conjecture, something quite outside his area, and then ended up go during that time, because he had many people that were willing to tell him how it, uh, how it uh, worked, and then he gave a a course on it the following term from a PD perspective. I didn't know that. Okay, thank you. Okay, so anyway, the, the personalities uh, can be very interesting. Of course, uh, Galois and Abel, the tragic heroes who died when they were very young, that's already very overused. Uh, everybody <laughs> and his uncle wrote about it. But uh, also, I mean, the people are interesting. They, they, and and wh whoever writes about mathematics should try 
uh, to show these are not all nerds, or maybe they are nerds, but, <laughs> uh, but they're, they're interesting. It's interesting to learn more about these people. Um, okay, now, procedure of the proof, or a, at least the proof idea. And there, every time is different. Uh, uh, so something, let's say, sum of reciprocal squares, uh, how to show that that become, has anything to do with pi. Uh, you can tell the reader how interesting that is, that just adding some numbers, uh, num uh, you, you get something to do with pi. It's very interesting. You can even explain it a little. Okay? Um, Kepler's conjecture actually is quite easy to explain. You say uh, that this <coughs> person, Thomas Hales, he just reduced the problem to 5,000 configurations and then had the computer work through all these uh, configurations until the computer found the correct, uh, th that there was only one configuration left, the densest packing, which is the pyramidal, pyramidal packing of oranges in, in the market. So that you can explain very easily, actually, to, in a newspaper article. Uh, Poincaré's conjecture, okay, I, I had help uh, a professor in New York who, who uh, really went with me through trying to explain to me, so I could explain it uh, then in the book, how, uh, how it was proven. But then you could um, sort of, you have to bring it down to earth to straighten out wrinkles of a manifold. And it's like, I use the um, example of Botox injections mm -hmm. when uh, women, elderly women, get injections to smoothen uh, their, uh, their wrinkles. So, and that's what the Ricci flow actually is. Uh, um, at least you can bring it closer to what people know about. That's what you try to do, what I try to do when I write an article, sort of related to something that people can relate to. Uh, implications of, uh, of um, the proof of the theory or whatever it is. So let's say number theory, I mentioned Hardy said nothing that has no applications at all. Of course, cryptography. So anything you write about number theory, the journalist can always say this is important because that's how we uh, encrypt our credit card numbers in the internet. Um, Random walk. What's a random walk good for? Uh -huh. You can tell them about finance, that the stock market is actually a random walk, and all these uh, tools that were developed to, uh, starting with Einstein, with Brown, Brownian motion, uh, uh, and then uh, Einstein dealt with random walks, and many other physicists, physicists and chemists, and then you say, huh, it has to do with the financial markets. And the options pricing formula um, is based on these theories of random walks. So uh, you can tell that's an application. That's where math really has an application. Uh, I think another Fields Medal at the same uh, in Madrid was Wendelin Werner. Who, who does a lot about random walks. He's not interested at all in finance. He does random walks, higher dimensional random walks, and so on. But they can, other people then can use these theories possibly for financial markets or other things. So that's what the reader needs to know, so that random walks are not something, they are something very abstract maybe, the theory, but have very down-to-earth uh, applications. Uh, topology, for instance, that I didn't even know in robotics, uh, that um, you try to see if area, higher dimensional areas are connected or simply connected. And why is that important in, in robotics? Because a robot has certain degrees of freedoms. Uh, the robot may have two arms and three legs and so on, and all, all these uh, um, append can move in three directions and you want to see actually in this higher dimensional space whether the robot can move from this position to this position if there's a path, a connected path 
that goes from here to there. And that would mean that uh, the robot can move his hand from here to here and the leg from somewhere to somewhere else. And if these areas are not connected, if they're bounded and separated, then this movement is not possible. Uh, this path is not possible. So topology can have uh, applications in robotics. And densest packings, okay, great. Kepler found out that you have to stack spheres like the vegetable market uh, people knew all along. It's in a pyramid. So what's new? Well, anyway, for text compression, for instance, densest packings are very important. So you can make a connection, a bridge between Kepler's uh, conjecture, uh, Kepler's theorem about densest uh, packings and text compression. Okay, sometimes unexpected difficulties arise. Now, I'll tell a short story, but this, uh, I'll read it to you. Uh, politics should play no role in mathematics, but mathematics is ubiquitous even in politics. Take the security fence that Israel is building on the West Bank. I'm not talking politics here, just <laughs> mathematics. So, uh, the security fence that Israel is building on the West Bank. Not only is the course of the construction in dispute, the two sides, the Palestinians and Israelis, cannot agree on a simple fact, how long it is. An Israeli army spokesman declared that the barrier around Jerusalem is 54 kilometers long. But Khalil Tufagji, uh, 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 a geographer at the Center for Palestinian Studies in Jerusalem, said he had checked the data and reached the conclusion that it is 72 kilometers long. <laughs> now, for once, both sides could be right or wrong. The reason is the mathematical theory of fractals. And here I'll now show you something. Uh, can I ask you to put uh, it, uh, said part two. There's a movie, uh, uh, um, there's a movie, a uh, 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 team came to Israel to make a movie about, uh, yeah, a movie about my work. And they said, how can you somehow combine what you do in math and your political reporting about the Middle East conflict? And I said, ah, great idea. I'll use this uh, security law. This is in French now. So it's, uh, are you aware of fractals? Uh, can, can you stop it for a second? Um, there, there's a famous paper by Benoit Mandelbrot about how long is the coast of Britain, which says if, if you use this scale, then it's so many miles. If you use a smaller scale, then you see all the inlets and uh, fjords, and it becomes much long, longer. If you use an even better scale, it becomes even longer still. So the length of the coast of Britain is undefined. You can only give actually the, di the fractal dimension of this line. So I use this uh, with the uh, security fence in Israel, which combined my work as a political uh, 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 correspondent and mathematics. So let's. Uh, so first, it just explains in French what fractals are. So. Sorry about that. So. So. so here's the map. Uh, I have two maps of, uh, uh, of Jerusalem. Oh, <laughs> And I had a moustache. <laughs> so with a small scale, it's just a, a straight line, this part of the border. But if you look at something with more detail, then you see little inlets and so on. So the, the border becomes longer. So, uh, according to the theory of fractals, there's not necessarily a well-defined length of the border. On one map it's 10 kilometers, uh, on another it's 15 kilometers. 
So now here you see uh, in Jerusalem the security fence is a wall, and you see the wall goes around, and sometimes. La cause repose dans la théorie des fractales qui décrit des modèles géométriques qui se répètent à toutes les échelles. So here you see it goes around. Maybe this person had a building there and he went to the Supreme Court, and so they had to change the how do you say uh, how the, the, the root of the wall. And so it depends how you measure it. It could be 54 kilometers on a different scale. It's 72 kilometers. So, okay, so that's the, I, I, I was very flattered. They sent over a sound man, a cameraman, and whatever, a producer, and did the whole movie. And then I came uh, uh, in London, actually. They showed the movie, and that's part three. And that's what they then showed. George Pilas the book that won a media award from the Swiss Natural Sciences Academy in 2003. George Spiro uses concrete examples to describe certain mathematical phenomena. So, to explain fractal theory, George takes the example of borders on maps. On a large scale... Jerusalem is gone, the war is gone, nothing, no security things, too political, we don't want to have anything to do with it. I thought it was a great example, but they just hit out. <laughs> 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 Used Spain and Portugal instead. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, can we go back to the. <coughs> okay, um, so I, uh, I write about math. I don't know. Not, by a long shot, not everything, but uh, not even uh, all the subject of math. So I need help, usually, from, from the mathematician who did uh, do the proof or the theory or whatever. But not everybody, some are very helpful, but not everybody takes kindly. Uh, some, they want to be wise guys. They say, you don't understand anything, and you never will, and I, I'm not interested in explaining it to you. Uh, some wrinkle their nose, some are holier than thou, uh -huh. and some are offended. Uh -huh. So, uh, as an example, that's what I wrote. Uh, the Navier-Stokes equations are only solvable in special cases. Using computers, approximations can be computed, but such numerical models are very delicate. I think there's not much to argue about a sentence like that. But then there was a reader's letter which said, this could have been written in the tabloid press. I, I don't think so, but anyway, that's what the person says. Every math student knows that differential equations cannot be solved in closed form, etc., etc. Nothing, uh, I, I don't know, it was just trying, trying to be a wise guy, trying to show me uh, that I don't know anything. Not that I mind, I, I, I mean, I, I don't care, but it, it just shows not everybody likes to have Mathematics written about uh, for the popular for the popular press. Some wrinkle their nose. I'm sorry, the uh, color doesn't come out. So that's about one of uh, about the book Kepler's conjecture. So what this that was a reviewer of the book. Um, no, before it was published, somebody who was supposed to proofread the book. So this person writes. Um, I can't remember his name, but he, he was a professor. He is a professor at a well-known university. I don't really like this book. Of course, I should give some examples to show what I mean. So what are the examples? Using sex to spice up mathematics. Uh, and what is the example? The first paragraph of chapter 2 is devoted to the fact that Kepler was conceived out of wedlock. That was sex using to spice up the book. <laughs> Dwelling on long dead thinkers as assholes, and not my, that's the quote, it's not I who said that. On page two, apparently Kepler had inherited his mother's disagree, disagreeable disposition, was nasty to most, that's what I wrote, was nasty to most of his classmates and constantly got involved in fights and petty arguments. That's a fact that I read in, in uh, accounts on Kepler, but 
this person, this reviewer, didn't want anything bad to be said about Kepler. Kepler's uh, holy. You, sh you shouldn't say anything about it. Um, and then I said something. If, unfortunately, with time, celebrity went to Durer's head, and he became something of a prima donna. <laughs> so I think uh, that you can write that in a book, but this person didn't like it. Uh, Spiro seems to have in mind an impatient, smart, alecky reader who is sexually experienced. <laughs> <laughs> I promise you this. Uh, all I wrote was, uh, to, uh, I'll, I'll read it quickly. Uh, he was, uh, Kepler was born seven months after his parents got married. Um, and then I say, don't believe uh, he was premature. He wasn't conceived out of wedlock. He was premature. Why was that important? Um, because he was an astrologer also. He believed very much. He, he said he was conceived when the uh, stars were in the... I mean, everything he did had to do, or much of what he did had to do with the stars. So he was very interested of when he was conceived. And that's how he... That's why this was important. It has nothing to do with sex. I don't know what this person meant, but that's why he refused to, to, to have anything to do with the book. With this that book. Um, some professionals are holier than thou. My reading was held up by the tone of your text. You referred to questions of priorities. Now, he says, questions such as these, no, I said, such questions such as these are of extreme importance, if to nobody else, then to least, at least to those involved. Now, the person writes, I found myself wondering why would anybody want to read this chapter? Uh, I think uh, priority disputes are very interesting to uh, not only to the general readers, but our profession, your profession. I mean, people get involved in priority disputes. Everybody would like to read it. And this is really a holier than thou attitude. Oh, no, we're not interested in priority disputes. It's only truth and uh, whatever. Uh, anyway, uh, so some people, I think it was just because they don't want non-mathematicians to read about their own. It's like a secret society. Some people think so. Um, I think you're writing a similar when you run through a list of the unsuccessful attempts of the Poincaré conjecture, but they are, at, it seems, even less rewarding to read, given your flippant tone. Okay, flippant tone, that's the way one writes when you want to get the reader interested. As I said, academics must read uh, uh, proofs and whatever you write, but the general reader wants to read about priority disputes, wants to hear a flippant tone, uh, all these things. But no, some uh, mathematicians wouldn't, uh, would want to keep mathematics pure. Uh, some professionals are offended. Now, this is Dr. Yao. Uh, he, um, uh, what's his first name? Shin Tzu. He, he's a very famous professor. What? Shing Tung. Shing Tung, a, a very famous Chinese professor at Harvard, a Fields medalist, uh, um, I mean, an outstanding mathematician, but with a Poincaré conjecture, he maintained that his students had actually uh, corrected Poincaré, um, uh, Perelman's proof, that Perelman had made mistakes and they corrected them. The general uh, opinion now is that Perman didn't write every single step. Sometimes uh, you, you make a bit of a jump and these uh, Yao students uh, just filled in the, these missing uh, leaps. But uh, Yao was very serious. He, sued the, he was going to sue the New Yorker for the article I told you about that uh, Sylvia Nassar wrote in the New Yorker, and then he, he was going to sue uh, our, my publisher also. Dr. Yao insists that any facts published about him be truthful and accurate. The attached material established that a significant portion of what Mr. Spiro wrote about Dr. Yao in the draft, he sent my client for comments, is not only factually in, in, inaccurate, but also potentially defamatory. And he threatened uh, with a lawsuit. 
So I was very happy because I thought if there is a lawsuit, it's really <laughs> in three sales. Um, anyway, he even offered to work with me, meaning he would write the chapter and let me uh, publish it uh, so it would be accurate, etc., etc. Um, anyway, uh, that's what his lawyer wrote. And then the lawyer of uh, um, my publisher wrote, uh, they decreased on the interpretation and you can sue for that and anyway we have the first amendment uh, and so anyway um, nothing never heard of Dr. Yao again <laughs> um, okay now what why does a journalist write yeah, first of all uh, you have to know uh, you have to know uh, I need to know uh, the journalist duty is towards the readership not towards the mathematicians I mean uh, he must be fair to the mathematician uh, shouldn't write uh, incorrect things I said you write about the personality also so you have to be careful you you have to write uh, uh, you have to be truthful on, and not defamatory um, but uh, uh, my duty is towards the general reader that's my first duty um, the general reader must be informed, but must also be entertained. That's why they read. That's what I said in the beginning. You want them to read the article, so you have to make it interesting, induce them to read it. And since mathematics is such a technical subject, he has a great responsibility because um, the general readership will take what he or she, what they read in the newspaper and form their opinions about mathematics. So, uh, because they, they'll never read the, the mathematics article uh, in the original. They depend on, the, on what's written in the newspaper. So there's quite a responsibility uh, that the journalist carries. So the subtitle of my talk was the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Mm -hmm. So truth means not to report untruths. Mm -hmm. So let's look at that. Okay, the full truth means not to report half truths. So uh, you have to uh, write everything that's true. And nothing but the truth means not to mix truth with irrelevant or misleading information. <laughs> uh, this is my animation. And, uh, okay, so truth means not to report untruths. Well, graph theory, I use spider nets to sort of uh, get people to think about what a graph theory is. Uh, it's, not it's not an untruth, it's not exactly, I mean, graph theory has nothing to do with spider nets, but a person can relate to spider nets. Random walk, uh, you, one always uses the way a, a drunken sailor walks around the lamppost as a, a random walk, so that's very, um, how do you say, uh, one, one can imagine something. A non-mathematician can now understand what is meant by a random walk. Uh, Poincaré's conjecture, for instance, I don't want to report untruths, but in three dimension, the three-dimensional version is difficult to explain. So maybe restrict it to two dimensions at the beginning, uh, an ant walking on, on, on a globe, for instance. Uh, so you, you don't say anything that true, but you don't necessarily say everything. Um, uh, Kahn theory, so the three-body problem, and you say the solar system is stable. Well, that's not the whole story, because we have nine planets, and Kahn theory to only talks about the three, three planets. So I'm not lying. I'm, I'm not saying something untrue, but I'm not necessarily reporting, well, we'll now get to the whole truth. Uh, the whole truth means not to report half truths. So, uh, Radon transform. I uh, I say it's being used for medical imaging. That may not be the most important thing for Radon transforms, but the reader understands what I'm talking about. Uh, matrix multiplications, eigenvectors. What are they good for? Well, transformations in, in Walt Disney's movie, Pixar, and so on. They, they, uh, all these things is to rotate uh, figures. It, it's uh, matrix multiplications. So, um, yeah, it's not, it's a half, well, 
it's half truth. It's not matrix multiplication is much more than just animated movies. But in a newspaper, maybe you can write just uh, tell about uh, uh, animated films, and then at least the reader will understand. Um, nothing but the truth means not to mix truths with irrelevant or misleading information. Am I guilty of, uh, of contravening that? Yes, I write, uh, let's say I write about some problems and I write there's a million dollar prize on it. That's not really relevant to the mathematical problem, but it's interesting. So uh, it's irrelevant. It's not misleading, but it's irrelevant. Uh, priority disputes. Okay, also not necessarily strictly relevant to the mathematical problem, but a journalist would write about that. Um, hobbies or pastimes of, of the uh, people involved. Totally irrelevant, but interesting. At least it gets the reader maybe to read about the problem if you talk about the hobbies or pastimes of the people behind that. Uh, Biberbach and Teichmüller uh, were uh, vehement Nazis. Is that important? No. Teichmüller spaces has nothing to do with uh, Teichmüller's uh, political uh, opinions. But as a journalist, I would remind people that Biberbach was, an, uh, was a Nazi um, because I think it is interesting for the reader. Um, so, uh, the journalist cannot always meticulously abide by the truth, cannot always tell the whole truth, but can sometimes recount a bit more than the truth. And uh, this is it. Thank you very much.